So, uh, so, I, so, just to, uh, so I want to give some examples of the kinds of changes and, and, and try to draw a distinction between the kinds of things that we have every day and what we see in Alzheimer's disease and the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. So we see more forgetfulness. We're all forgetful on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and you know we misplace things and we might forget little tidbits of a conversation but in Alzheimer's disease people are losing things They're, they need help from their spouse to find them far more than they used to um, they are forgetting conversations completely they're missing appointments they're having trouble taking their medications they might be subtle things but they're new things uh, and they're not you know they're not characteristic of, of that individual often these, this kind of forgetfulness manifests as repetitious questions. So, you know, waking up in the morning and saying, now what are we doing today? And then 10 minutes later, again, what are we doing today? And again, 10 minutes later, you know, so over and over and over again, uh, because, as if they never heard that. And that's, that's a problem in short-term memory. So the ability to put new information into storage, that's disrupted. All those old memories that have already been stored away, they're there, they can draw on them, but that new information, but yesterday, wasn't written into the brain banks uh, because of where the problems are in Alzheimer's disease. And that's why we see prominent short-term memory problems. So they're not processing. They're not, pro yeah, so the brain's not processing the short-term stuff and storing it away. It might for a few seconds or a few, a few minutes, but that long, longer term, or short, I mean the short-term storage of new information is not as efficient and, uh, and so we see we see short-term memory problems while long-term memory tends to be preserved. Uh, the types of things we see, what we call executive function, this is the ability to organize and plan. Um, it's kind of a complicated cognitive idea, this executive function, but that's basically ability to organize and plan, organize information and plan on it and do the right things. Uh, so managing the household finances becomes problematic. Driving is a complicated thing and there's a lot of decisions involved. Uh, and that becomes problematic. There's also navigation, uh, which is a different area, but finding their way uh, through the city is clearly uh, often very problematic. And preparing meals, so putting a complicated recipe together um, is, a, is, is a problem um, often. So, and if you think about Thanksgiving dinner, that's the ultimate executive function task. Uh, you have all these different things that have to be done at just the right time and lots of ingredients in going into each one and and so when I'm sitting in clinic talking to a family member I often hear about oh last Christmas or last Thanksgiving mom couldn't do it she couldn't pull it off um, and we had to help out um, so these are the kinds of things that we that we see now when we're making a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease this is this this is the information we really focus on uh, it's a low-tech diagnosis still in the next year or two it might get much more high-tech but at this point, the gold standard for making a diagnosis rests on this kind of information, um, where we sit down with family, and we like to do it separate from the patient. Uh, we sit down with family, and we talk about mundane daily activities. How are they doing on a day-to-day -day basis in specific areas? And if it's clear, if there's clear evidence of decline in these different areas, then we are very suspicious for dementia, and, and then what causes the dementia most commonly Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so how does the brain change in Alzheimer's disease? Well we saw that picture of August D's brain uh, where we have those the buildup of, uh, of abnormal proteins and that's what we see that's what that's the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. I'll show another picture of it in a second but the brain's composed of all these different brain cells that are interconnected and the buildup of that those plaques and tangles we believe interferes with the ability for the, all those neurons to interact. Um, and that leads to problems in maintaining these higher order cognitive functions. Um, so that process disrupts the neurons. Here's a modern day picture of the plaques and tangles. And uh, there's two things that we see here. There's kind of the splotchy broad areas, which we call, my turn, we call plaques, these areas. That's amyloid plaque. And then if you see this sort of flame shaped, it's a neuron filled with a material uh, that we call tau. And those are tangles. So the, ha the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease are amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, so plaques and tangles. This is when we, when we diagnose 
Alzheimer's disease, we're predicting the presence of plaques and tangles in the brain. This is the definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease when we see plaques and tangles. But when we're sitting down talking to somebody uh, when they're alive, uh, we are making a prediction of the presence of these plaques and tangles. And we're pretty good at making that prediction, 90% accurate. So 10% of the time, it's something else driving the dementia. 90% of the time, it's plaques and tangles. Um, This is a pathological picture of the brain, yeah. So this is, we're under the microscope looking at a little piece of the brain here um, uh, and, and finding these amyloid plaques and tangles. Um, and there's a pathological diagnosis where a pathologist looks at the brain and makes a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Then there's the clinical side where we're in clinic and we're saying this is probably probable Alzheimer's disease, how we make the diagnosis. And again, we're right. We predict the presence of these in the brain 90% of the time.